All right, so chapter seven, everything on the exam will be seven and eight. And chapter seven is on all about kinematics. So when I go through and make the exam, I have a list of topics. And the topics that I have for chapter seven are angles, uh, kinematics calculations, and kinematics uh, conceptual. And so we'll look at those different types of questions. But like, uh, I'm not sure which quiz y'all took, but like the quiz with the clock question. Like, what is the angular displacement of the clock? Are y'all seeing questions like that? That would be something like an angle. And you'll have two or three questions in that. Uh, or, I don't know, um, making a conversion. So something from revolutions per second to radians per second. You have questions like that where you have to just sort of work with angles. Uh, and then calculations are kind of like, I don't know, the potter's wheel question that you might have seen. Or we worked in one of one or two of the classes where you have something spinning with a certain angular velocity, and I ask you various things about it. It's displacement or it's acceleration. You just have to figure out certain things, and we'll look at some stuff like that. And then the kinematics conceptual questions, well, we'll, we'll see some of those in the old tests. The concept tests are a good place to study those, to prepare for those. Um, so that, that's what you'll see for Chapter 7. And then in Chapter 8, oh, goodness, what are all the topics there? Uh, energy. Sorry, this isn't really in order. Newton's second law, torques, moment of inertia, and momentum. And each of those, I try to have a balance between conceptual and calculations. So um, we've done, the past couple of classes, we've been doing energy, second law, and momentum. And then in the previous class, and that's what the quiz was on today and this past Wednesday, was finding the, the torques or the net torques. Some of those would be conceptual, some of those would be calculations. Like actually, you'll have a bar or some other object with different forces acting on it. You have to find the net torque on it. Uh, and then you'll have some conceptual questions too. I like to do ranking questions, for example, where you're ranking the, the total torques. We'll look at one of those. And then moments of inertia, you're going to have to calculate the moment of inertia probably for a discrete set of particles, probably also for a rigid object where you use that table that I give you on your on your equation sheet. And then also you'll have some conceptual things. I like to do ranking questions on these where I give you some shape and I ask you to rank the moments of inertia. You'll definitely have a question like that. And we can look at some of those. So are any of these particular topics standing out to you? Uh, we'll look at all of them, but if one's standing out to you, we can go look at that first. Okay, finding the net torque. Uh, that and like in some of the diagrams, sometimes I felt like I'm starting to see a pattern, like in some of the uh, questions on the old test, like if the one on the left is uh, negative one, right, and positive. But I want to go. Oh no, no, no! Don't go, don't go by that. There's yeah. no pattern. Like, All right. I Unless there's no pattern, but like my mind is starting. Yeah, don't don't think that the one on the left is not necessarily positive or negative. Let's take a look at some exams. So. Um, mostly these are exams four. Sometimes we get some of it in exam three. So let's see, you guys have 17, 18, 19, right? In your, so let's look at, I don't know, fall 16. So this is uh, exam three. Don't write that down yet. I don't know if exam three is on there. Okay, yeah, so exam three. Uh, fall 16. This is number 25. What is the net torque on this object which rotates about the point C? So as we did in class, you know, first you find the forces that don't give any torque at all. And that's going to be this one. It doesn't give any torque because R is equal to zero for that one. So the net torque or the torque for that force, which is FR sine theta, is going to be zero. The other way that you can have a force that does zero torque is if theta is equal to zero degrees or 180 degrees. And for example, like if I had a, a force down here, that force doesn't do any torque. So you want to identify those forces that don't do any torques at all. And then you identify which is positive and which is negative. And the positive and negative will come about depending on the type of rotation that it, that it causes. So here, the one on the left, causes a what type of rotation about this point? Clockwise. Clockwise, yeah. And you can use your pencil and sort of look at how it rotates, or you can sort of imagine 
Well, this thing would rotate like that. That's a clockwise motion. So that's a negative torque. And over here, this one would cause, I like to draw the component of the force. That, that object, that force would cause a what? Counterclockwise. counterclockwise. So that would be a positive torque. But you know, it doesn't matter if it's on the left or right because if I had a force, for example, that was in this direction, that would cause a negative torque. Or if it was in this direction, that would cause a positive torque. So it really, there's really no pattern to whether the torque is positive or negative. It's on the left or right. Uh, it's really just, does it cause clockwise or counterclockwise torque? And thinking about sort of how it rotates about that axis of rotation will really help you in that. Um, so here I would say that my net torque, I'll call this torque 1 and torque 2, is going to be negative torque 1 plus torque 2. So that's going to be 20 times 1 plus 10 times 3 times sine of 30. That's going to be a negative 20 plus 15 or 5 newton meters. And it better be clockwise because clockwise is negative. But really what students trip up on is, is it positive or negative? Students often do trip up on that. Use a pencil, you know, sort of sketch out which way is this going to rotate. When I say use a pencil, what I like to do is I hold it up here, I hold it at the axis of rotation, and I say if I pull up in this direction, that makes it rotate in a clockwise direction. And if I pull up right here, that makes it go in this direction. There is no positive or negative. And sometimes it's not a bar. Sometimes, for example, it's a, a wheel or a hoop or a disc. You might have seen some of those uh, where if I have a wheel rotating about this place, I could have forces um, here that would cause clockwise. I could have a force here that would cause clockwise again. I could have a force here that would cause counterclockwise, right. And they, they all cause different directions of rotation. Okay? If you have a wheel, I like to think of it like this, like a steering wheel. And if I pull up on this side, that makes it go clockwise. If I pull down on this side, that makes it go clockwise too. Okay? All right. Um, does that help a little bit? Okay. Look, number 27 is a, is a good example, too. We didn't do this in class, but uh, it's, it's a good question, and you're likely to see something like it. I often like to have the ranking questions where you're ranking torques. Remember, torque is FR sine theta. So there are several things that, uh, that can increase or decrease the torque. One is the force. Another is the moment arm. Bigger moment arm means uh, bigger uh, torque. And then the other is the angle theta. So the further the angle goes away from 90 degrees, the smaller the torque. So here you want to look and see which one has the greatest torque, because that's really what we're asking, which is the greatest, which is the smallest. All of these wrenches are the same length, and all the forces are the same. So which one do you think would have the greatest torque, one, two, three, or four? Three. I like the answer two, but two is different because three is perpendicular, Right, this angle is 90, or at least it's, it's an angle that's closer to 90 than this one. So the component for 2, the component of the force that acts to cause the torque is smaller than the component of the force in number 3. So number 3 is the biggest, so that means it's not B and it's not C. And then which one has the smallest torque? Four. Well, it has to be 4. Well, no, it could be could be two, but we know that it's not two. Uh, four, because it has a small moment arm, R, and also it has an, an angle farther away from 90 degrees. Whereas over here in two, it has both of those. Or rather, it has a long moment arm, that gives it a big torque, and it has an angle, it has the same angle as it has in four. I right, just be prepared for those type of ranking questions. Is it bigger or smaller? You'll definitely see some like that. Um, 
you'll see some equilibrium problems like number 26. We did some of those in class. Okay, chapter 7. Um, so in the kinematics calculations, there are a couple of different things where you're using those kinematics equations, you know, that was the theta equals omega naught t plus one half alpha t squared, and omega equals omega naught plus alpha t. Also, don't forget that our linear and angular quantities are related to one another, and, and you'll have questions where you have to consider that, and that is that uh, v is equal to omega r, a is equal to alpha r, and then also uh, S is equal to theta R. So these are all related by the radius or the length of the moment arm, uh, the radius of the object. So for example, um, number 22 is a good example of something that uses these quantities. A tornado is 50 meters in diameter and carries 200 meters per second winds. What is its angular velocity? So I know V is 200. I know R, uh, I think actually in this test I changed this to radius. I'm going to change it here to radius. R is 50, and so if I want to know omega, it's going to be omega is V divided by R, 200 over 50, R4. And you might be inclined to put 4, that would be E in this case, but remember this is in radians per second. Um, students sometimes get confused about the units. If you're working with an equation and you put in a certain unit, like a revolutions or degrees per second, then that's what you're going to get out uh, in these kinematics equations. But in these equations where you're relating the angular to the uh, linear quantities, you're always going to be in SI units. So if you're thinking about these, uh, these equations, you always have to have SI units. That means your angles have to be in radians. Also, in Newton's second law, torques equals I alpha. Also, kinetic energy, uh, one half I omega squared. Those all have to be in SI units. Radians, radians, radians. But in these other equations, like Li equal LF, uh, and these kinematics equations, you can use whatever units you want. It doesn't matter. You can have revolution, or revela revolutions, uh, or radians, or degrees. Luis? How did you get omega equals field of R? How did you find out that? Oh, so here I have V equals omega R. So if I divide both sides, let's see, I'll do it over here. V equals omega R. If I divide both sides by R, that cancels out, and I get omega equals V over R. Okay, so um, now I'm just saying that because you have to convert these. And sometimes in problems, you'll have to convert the, the units. So four radians per second. Don't forget your unit conversion factors in one revolution. How many radians? You are amazing. So I have two pi radians, one revolution. Now four over two pi. That's 4 over 6, or 2 over 3, point, about 0.67. So D is the, uh, 0.64, rather. Okay? I could do that right now. If you had that test right now, you could do that part. Yeah, of course. Um, well, there's not one on this test. Uh, can we come back and we'll go to another test? We'll do a similar one. All right. Uh, so that's, let's look at some conceptual type questions that would come about with that. Uh, for example, we don't spend a whole lot of time in class on these, but it's useful to look at them. I think we had one in class like this. Let's do 23 and 24. Was that on the quiz? Awesome. So an object at rest begins to rotate with constant angular acceleration. If it moves to a certain angle in a time t, then what angle did it rotate in time 2t? So on these questions, you'll write down the equation that describes that particular value. It's, it's usually going to be either theta or omega, right? Omega is equal to alpha t. Um, 
and it's almost always going to be initially at rest because then that just makes the relationship a lot easier uh, to deal with. So if it moves through an angle theta and t, what angle does it move through in, in time, 2t? It's a quadratic relationship, so if I double t, I quadruple theta. Uh, what about omega? In time t, if it has an angular velocity omega, what would it have in time 2t? Double. Right? Double? Yeah, so if I doubled this, I would double that, because that's a linear relationship. Let's look at number 24. We haven't talked about this explicitly, though we talked about it in the notes. This fan is spinning as shown and is slowing down. Which of these pairs of statements is correct? If it's spinning clockwise, that means omega is positive or negative? negative. Right, clockwise is negative. So I can get rid of A and B. It has to be either C or D. Now, the next part is the trickier part is alpha the angular acceleration positive or negative i already know that i have a negative omega what is alpha going to be very good it's going to be positive and why is it positive right because it's the opposite direction of omega and i know it's the opposite direction because it's slowing down so if it's slowing down that doesn't mean alpha is negative that means alpha is opposite Omega. That's, you know, chapter two. We talked about that in chapter two. If V and A are in the same direction, it's speeding up. If V and A are in opposite directions, it's slowing down. So uh, my omega is negative, but my alpha, my angular acceleration, is positive. I like to ask those sorts of questions, too. I like to ask all the questions, in fact. Okay? Let's look. While we're here, let's look at centripetal forces and accelerations. Can I take this away, y'all? Uh, number 19 and 20. Number 19 is uh, just asking, you know, first, if you're on the Gravitron at the Fireman's Fair, I think that's what they call it. They, is that what they call it? The Gravitron? Whatever. The thing that you get on, you spin. It's like a tin can. They spin you around. You're up against the wall. Um, if you're on that ride, I don't ride it. But if you're on that ride, what is providing the centripetal force? Remember, a centripetal force is a separate, or is not a separate force, that it just identifies one of the forces in the system. So in this system, what is the frictional, or what is the, uh, the centripetal force? The wall. The wall, right. So that is the normal force. The wall pushes against you. That is the normal force. That's what's causing you to move in a circular path. It's pushing on your back and making you not go in a straight line, but to go in a circular path. If that wall just disappeared, you just fly off in a straight line. Now, I want to know what is the value of the centripetal force. I, I know that centripetal acceleration is V squared over R. By the way, we have another expression for centripetal acceleration. It is also equal to omega squared R. That's just because I know that V is equal to omega R, and so I can sub that into that, substitute that into V squared over R. V equals omega R, uh, omega R squared over R is omega squared R. It's just subbing that in. And so I can use that, I can use that equation instead to find the centripetal acceleration. I know that F is equal to m times a, so that's m omega squared r. Okay, so now I need to find omega. Um, I give you the angular velocity up here, two revolutions per second. Sorry, I didn't write this equation up here, but in this equation, you always have to use SI units as well. Again, I know there's sort of Confusion about which units to use. So if you're ever confused, just use SI. So uh, omega is two revolutions per second. I need to convert that into radians. So that's going to be four pi radians per second. I'm just going to leave it as a pi, as pi, and we'll come back here. 
I have my mass. That's my mass. I'm at 70 kilograms. Omega is 4 pi squared uh, times R, which is given is 5 meters. So that's going to be 70 times 144. I'm just going to sort of estimate what it is. 350. It's a lot. I think it's D. Oh, no. It's Yeah, 50, the 55,000. It's not actually 144, right? It's 4 times 5 squared, but that's roughly 140. Okay? So that's the right answer for that. Look through, though. There are other centripetal force questions that are different, and you'll, you'll get a feel for them, but you definitely want to practice those. You'll have one or two questions dealing with centripetal forces. Megan? Yeah, yeah. These are tricky. Students have difficulty with them. Let's let's go to a different exam. See, that was fall 16. Let's go to fall 15, exam 3. Hold on, let's see if there's one here. Yeah, here's two good ones. So... Let's do 23 first. It's a little easier. A boy swings a 10 kilogram stone in a horizontal circus, uh, circle with a radius of 2 meters and it breaks under 80 newtons of tension. What is the maximum speed? This is a lot like the car going around this curve where you, you have to figure out what is the frictional force or what is the coefficient of friction. Um, except now instead of the frictional force providing the centripetal force, it's the what force providing the centripetal force? The tension of the string. So I have this kid swinging a stone over his head like this, right? And I want to know what is the maximum speed. Let's, let's draw a picture. There's the kid. He has one arm that's really a lot longer than the other. And the string goes like this. Okay? Um, it's like a sling. Like he's getting ready to... No rock like Jacob. Um, so my centripetal force is my tension. It acts as a centripetal force, and it's equal to 80 newtons, or that's the maximum that it can be. But I know that my centripetal force is also mv squared over r. So I want to know what is the maximum speed, the, the translational speed, or the linear speed in meters per second that it can have. So I'm looking for V. That's what it's looking for. So I say 80 newtons equals mv squared over r. m is 10. v squared divided by r, which is 2. Uh, 160 divided by 10 equals v squared. That's square root of 16. So going to be 4 meters per second. I often try to give you easy numbers for this, so just you don't have to use your calculator. Sometimes you do need to use your calculator, but I often try to give you easy numbers. So that's one type of example. Let's look at the previous one too, though. That one's a little more complicated. All right, I'll go away from here. All right, uh, the distance from the center of a Ferris wheel to a passenger is 12 meters. What is the centripetal acceleration when, oh, this one's not that hard. We'll, we'll come to find. So let's see. Let's see if there's one up here. We'll look for another Ferris wheel problem, okay, as we're going through the test. But here, let's just find the centripetal acceleration. Here, I give you the angular speed, I give you the radius, and I know that centripetal acceleration is omega squared r. Remember, there are two expressions. There's the v squared over r, and then that's also equal to omega squared r, just a simple substitution. And so omega squared r is 0.5 squared times the radius, which is 12, um, which is going to be a quarter. It's going to be 3 meters per second squared. Okay? Um, Let's talk right now. We might not see one of those problems, but in the notes, I do talk about uh, going over a 
going over a curve like this. Let me show you. You'll see questions like that. Like, let's say that you're in a car. My wife's from Missouri. And in Missouri, there are lots of rolling hills. And it's kind of fun. It's like riding a roller coaster, right? You ever been driving on like rolling hills? Especially if you go really fast. And it's sort of, you go up and you go down, and you go up and you go down. Um, imagine that you're sitting in a car that's driving over this hill. And you're sitting, this is you, with your mind on your money and your money on your mind. So I have, I'm sitting in this car. And there are forces that are acting on me that act as the centripetal force. What are the forces, the vertical forces that are acting on me in this car? Normal. The normal force is one. What's the other one? The weight. These two forces combined act as the centripetal force. Because you remember, the centripetal force is the force in the uh, in the center seeking. So it's the force that acts in this direction. And so Fn minus Fw will equal to our centripetal force, is equal to mv squared over r. Okay? When you go over a hill, uh, over a hill like this, how does it feel? Does it feel like you're being pushed down into your seat, or does it feel like you're flying up out of your seat? Go down. No, when you're going on top of a hill, you're coming up over a hill like this. Does it, does it feel like you're being pushed down into your seat? Or does it feel like you're flying up out of your seat? It's like it's like you're woo, like right, like you like on a roller coaster too. When you go up over a roller coaster, it's like you're coming up out of your seat. And the reason for that is is that uh, my normal force, if I try to calculate my normal force, it's going to come out to be small or even zero or even negative. So here, uh, my centripetal acceleration, this is going to be negative. I have a negative AR or AC, we call it, centripetal acceleration. So I'm going to put a negative sign right here. So my normal force is going to equal to FW minus MV squared over R. So now my normal force is actually less than the weight. Whereas over here, in the same situation when I'm going on a, on, a, on a downward hill or like in a valley, the ex centripetal acceleration, AC, is positive. See how it's actually in the upward direction? And so if I do the same equation, Fn minus Fw equals positive mv squared over r, then I get a value for Fn that's equal to Fw plus mv squared over r. And so when you go into a downward curve like that, does it feel like you're you're heavier or lighter? It feels like you're heavier because you have this acceleration that is actually in the upward direction. This is a lot like the elevator problems that we had back in chapter four, that if you were going with a downward acceleration, it felt like you were lighter so that your normal force was smaller than your weight. If you're going with an upward acceleration, like on the left, on the right hand side, it feels like you're heavier because your normal force is bigger than your weight. That's almost identical to the elevator problem, in fact. It really depends on the direction of your acceleration, except now I'm dealing with a centripetal acceleration, which is always center seeking, which is always towards the center of the circle. Okay? Okay. You okay on that topic? I see you nodding your head, but I'm not sure that you are. So you need to practice this. Uh, you'll see them. We haven't spent much time on centripetal forces in the class. We spent a little bit of time. But go through and look at the test questions. Look in your notes, too. In the, the videos on ch Chapter 7, we talk about centripetal acceleration. Okay. Um, We do chapter eight. We get chapter eight. All right, chapter eight is usually exam four. Uh, you're gonna have moment of inertia. Oh, I'm sorry. Go back. Yeah. The, I remember an example one that we I think it was about the tornado being another example. Okay. 
it was about, I don't know, it was something about, I know we did a revolution parade, a radiant revolution uh -huh. the last step. I think it might have been in the test control. This one? There it is. This number 22? Yes. What about it? Uh, I'd like it to be another example. Oh, okay. Um, all right. I don't know if I can, let me see. I don't have these always in test. Sometimes I don't pull that topic. Yeah, I don't see it right off, Louise. So let's let's uh let's move on to chapter eight because we're running like our time is short. Okay. We only have about twenty more minutes, fifteen or twenty minutes. But then if we need, we can hang out and, and do it too. Okay. Okay. So um, in chapter eight, moment of inertia, torques, Newton's second law, energy, and the work energy theorem, and then angular momentum. Those are the things that we've done today and Wednesday. Moment of inertia. You're going to have a question like number four, where I give you some shape or, or a series of shapes, and I ask you what is to rank the moments of inertia. I give these in every class, but you'll have a different shape than you've ever seen before. So on those questions, what you're looking for, the one with the, the biggest moment of inertia is the one that has the most mass at the biggest radius. That's what you're looking to find. So for example, here, A is the axis about which it rotates that it has the biggest uh, moment of inertia. So A, I don't know how to do this, I'm rotating like this axis right here. And so this whole thing is rotating about that axis. Like a big C that's coming out rotating about that axis. So like if this is here, my axis A, it would go like this. But it would have a little thing at the top. But it would rotate about that axis. So A is the biggest. What's going to be the smallest here? D is the smallest. Because look, at D, most of the mass is at really small as at zero radius. So all this doesn't contribute to the moment of inertia at all. And then this just goes out to like half the, the total distance that it could. So D is the smallest, A is the biggest. So that means that the answer has to be B. And then just to confirm, I can see that uh, C is not equal to B. That this radius, or this axis of rotation is not the same as that axis. Be prepared for those. You'll have at least one where you have to rank them. Probably just one. The other is going to be flight number five, where I give you some system, and you have to find the total moment of inertia. On this problem, uh, you have to find the moment of inertia of the bar. That's 1 12th mb squared. And you have to find out the moment of inertia of this particle right here. Um, you know... I know that to treat it as a particle one because there's no object on my table that fits that that object. Like right? there is no object that rotates about an axis that that's outside of that object. Right? It's not a sphere. It's not a bar. It's not. It's not any of those things. So I treat this as a discrete particle, and so that's going to be m r squared. Calculate the total moment of or the moment of inertia for each individual object, and then you add them together. You're going to have um, some conceptual questions, like, for example, number three, a solid sphere, hoop, and cylinder, all the same mass and radius, which is the most difficult to spin. Uh, you can think about this conceptually, or you can look at the equations. You could look at the equation. Do you know which of those is the has the most, the highest moment of inertia? The Sphere, hoop, or cylinder? Hmm? The sphere is hardest to spin? No, the sphere is not hardest to spin. Actually, it's going to be the hoop that's going to be the hardest to spin. Because if you think about a sphere, there is mass distributed all along the radii. You have some mass at small radii and other mass at large radii. Same with the cylinder. You have mass distributed at many different radii. But for the hoop, all the mass is at the biggest radius. 
The same is true for a, a hollow sphere as well. A uh, hoop is just sort of like a two-dimensional hollow sphere. Okay, so that answer would be hoop. But you could see that with the equations because you'd have mr squared for hoop. Uh, what cylinder? I think it's like, oh yeah, one half mr squared. And for a sphere, is it two thirds? Two fifths. Two fifths. Y'all, y'all know that? Like off the top of your head? Two thirds is the hollow. Two fifths is the sphere. How do you know that? Like you memorize it? Yes, sir. Don't memorize those things. It's okay. I guess you've just been using them. Have you been practicing a lot? Because y'all are like the A team in here. Y'all ever watched the A team that show with Mr. T? Y'all never seen that? Which one of you is Mr. T? Y'all know who I'm talking about? Mr. T? With all the gold chains? Yeah. Right. The A team. All right. Um, okay. So. You're going to have to do something like number nine. We've already done those. Uh, or like number seven, where you have to find out what is the net torque and what is the angular acceleration. Uh, number six here is an angular momentum problem. So you'll have a system. You'll know that it's angular momentum because it'll have two different objects, and they'll be coming together in some way. This has a bar and a flywheel. So I said the flywheel, I said this in class, and I'll make it clear on the exam, but a flywheel is a disc. I have these two objects, they're rotating separately, and then they come together, and I want to know what is the new speed. So the way you approach these is you say Li is equal to LF. Uh, Li is the initial angular momentum. Remember, angular momentum is I omega. So the bar has an I of 4 and an omega of 3. Plus, the flywheel has a, an I of 8, and initially it has zero velocity, zero angular velocity. And I want to know what is the new speed that they, after they engage, what is the new speed? So it's going to be 8 plus 4, or 12, times omega final. So that's 12 equals 12 omega final. So they're going to be rotating at one revolution per second. Notice I put in revolutions per second, I get out revolutions per second. Angular momentum problems. You'll see some, some conceptual questions about that as well. If I can find one. What? That part? No. The bar, I understand that's moving at 12. And I knew the flywheel was just stationary. But 8 times 0 would be 0, and which means it would be 12. How did you get omega final 12? Oh. All right, so I get 12 over on this side equals to 8 plus 4. That's because I'm combining these two objects together. This is like a perfectly inelastic collision. It's just, you know, where the two objects stuck together and move off in the same velocity, uh, except they're rotating. It's still called a perfectly inelastic collision, actually, because they're rotating separately, and then they come together, and they rotate at the same speed. All right. Um, let's see if I can find. That's all. Okay, here's a good example of a conceptual question for angular momentum. A figure skater pulls her arms in to decrease her moment of inertia by a factor of two. As a result, she spins twice as fast. Oh, this is a good one. What happened to her rotational energy? Whew, so I have my angular momentum is L equals I omega. My kinetic energy is one half I omega squared. If she pulls her arms in to decrease her moment of inertia by a factor of two, that means that uh, this has gone down by a factor of a by a factor of a half, and her angular velocity has gone up by a factor of two, because this has to be constant. If I have i omega. If I goes down, that means that omega has to go up by the same amount. I goes down by a factor of two, or a half, then omega has to go up by a factor of two. She pulls her arms in, she spins faster. Now, for kinetic energy, I'm asking, 
how does the kinetic energy change? So if I have I changing by one half and omega changing by a factor of two, which is actually squared, half of two squared is going to be increased by a factor of two. Now, I really gave you a little more information than you needed. Like I could have, I could have left out this sentence. I'm not even sure why I included that sentence, but I should. Have, I could have left out that sentence, and you still could have answered that question, right? Because I know that if this decreases by a half, then this has to increase by a factor of two. I should have known that without even writing it. I don't know why I wrote it, just because. Okay. You should be able to recognize that, that if I decreases, omega increases by the same amount. Because this is always constant, unless there's an outside force, which there's not. We're assuming there's not. That's a good, good, good conceptual question as we're going through this. You'll see similar ones in other exams. Okay, now energy. I like this one too because it relates to energy. Um... Let's look at a different exam. This is fall 15. Oh, let's go to fall 12. This is exam 3. Okay. Yeah, so the energy stuff, there are a couple different problems that you could see. This one is pretty basic. It's just asking what is the energy? So my kinetic energy is one half I omega squared. Uh, I is, well, this is a disk, so it's one half MR squared. That's a half of a 0.5 kilograms times one squared. That's a quarter or 0.25 um, kilogram meter squared. So my kinetic energy is going to be one half of one quarter or 0.25 times omega, which I give you here, is 10 radians per second squared. It's 1 eighth of 100. It's 13 joules. Okay. Uh, the other type of problem that you might see, uh, they aren't very common, but you'll likely see one, is something to do with the work energy theorem. Work causes a change in kinetic energy. So if I have, say, for example, a disk rotating, and I have some force acting, and I would tell you that force acted over, say, an angle of so many radians, then what is the new angular velocity of that object? So the way you'd do that is you would say uh, the torque is equal to F times R. And then the torque times the angular displacement will equal to one half I omega squared. And then you can solve that for omega. There aren't many questions like that in the old exams. You'll probably just find a few that are similar to that. But I would expect it on your exam. It's something that I want you to know. How to apply the work energy theorem in, in uh, exams. We'll do it in a later help session. I think we're, we want to put some numbers in here and just sort of see how this works out. Is that okay? We'll make this the last one. Y'all look tired. Are you tired? You're... All right. Well, let's say I have a disc. Let's say that the mass is two kilograms. Say that the radius is three meters. Um, and I want to know what is the angular velocity of this rotating disc after I apply a force of, say, 10 newtons over an angular displacement of, uh, let's just say, one radian, just to make the math a little easier. So the first thing you need to do is to figure out the torque. The torque is equal to F times R sine theta, though that's 90 degrees. So that's 10 newtons times 3 meters, or 30 newton meters. That's my first step. And now I can come up here. My torque, 30 newton meters, times my angular displacement, one radian. 
Right? This is my work. I'm finding the work. Work equals a change in kinetic energy. So that's the work that I do. My torque times my angular displacement is equal to one half. I need to know the moments of inertia. Pi for a disk is one half mr squared. That's one half of two times three squared. That's equal to nine. So one half of nine times omega squared. And then I would solve that for omega. That's 60 divided by nine. Square root of that, that's omega. Okay, in the next help session, we're going to have a help session on Tuesday. We'll do, so, we'll do another problem or two like that. But it's going to be really similar to that. If I do work on an object, I change its kinetic energy. Now, what is its new velocity? There are other ways to do this, just like we saw when we did work energy before, that require you to calculate the acceleration, uh, figure out, you know, what is its final velocity, and then calculate the energy. But this is a lot easier. It's a much easier method, just like we saw in chapter uh, five when we did work energy theorem. Okay? And then that touches on every topic that we've had since chapter two, two, three, four, five, and six in chapter eight are all, two through six are all in chapter eight now. Of course, not in as much depth, but we see every single topic that we've had so far in chapter eight. So it's really just a repeat, nothing new in this chapter. It's all, all old stuff. Okay. Let's stop the video.